Indications have emerged that the refusal of political parties to submit to the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, their annual financial statements as required by the Constitution and the Electoral Act has prevented the Commission from monitoring their finances and publishing the same as mandated by the Constitution. INEC has confirmed that it audited the accounts of the parties up to 2016 and it had gone far on their 2017 and 2018 accounts whilst awaiting the remaining years. Now, INEC Chairman Professor Mahmoud Yakubu said at a meeting with Chairman of Political Parties in March 2021 that only one political party complied with the constitutional provision, warning that their refusal to comply was in contravention of the law. Section 86 of the Electoral Act mandates that every political party uh, must submit its detailed annual statement of account to the Commission. Well, joining us to discuss this is Bolahan Olojade. He's an economist. And Paul James is the program manager of elections uh, for Yaga Africa. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Gentlemen, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah thank you. Good evening. Okay, great. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm going to start with you, um, um, Bolahan. The, the, the make, major question that everybody is asking is that these political parties constantly know uh, that what is expected of them um, legally in terms of making these um, reports, their financial reports known to not just INEC, but making it plain so that people can actually say, well, you're doing the right thing or not. I remember sometime in 2014, Serap actually uh, petitioned the political parties, especially the APC and the PDP, to make their um, accounts public so that people can tell if they were going above the spending. But we're in 2022 and that still has not been done. What do you think is responsible for the foot dragging? Well, I, I think, what is the punishment for not doing it? One million naira fine. So who, who cares about a million naira fine? That's what the law says. The official or a political party that fails to obey that section of the Electoral Act should be liable to, a, to one million naira fine. Is that punitive enough? Is that, is that something that could push a political party to want to obey? I don't think so. And I'm also, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised as to why this has remained the punishment for non-compliance. Because it's actually a very fundamental issue to know who is donating money, big money to political parties, and how the money is being spent. The accountability, the asset and liability and the expenses of the parties must be known. I'm not to make public to, 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 to uh, Nigeria. This thing is actually meant to be published in two newspapers. Hmm. But if the information are not there, the audit has not been concluded, what will, what will INEC have to publish? And if they don't, if the political parties don't comply, what is the punishment? The officer or the political party that does not comply will pay one million fine or six months jail. I don't, I don't think that that is enough uh, to push the political uh, parties to comply. Hmm. So there needs to be more deterrence. But, but let me move to Paul. Paul, let's talk about um, election expenditure and third party spending. We know, and you and I know, uh, that putting parties in check even becomes dire when it's full-fledged campaign season. We see that, um, you know, a lot of people will say, well, this person has sponsored, this person is sponsoring... Um, these people are giving us money to do this. Um, and it has far-reaching effects. Could this also be part of the problems that INEC is grappling with? And what could be the way to deal better with this, you know, issues? Like Bolaho has said, what million naira is chicken change for um, these political parties or these politicians, a slap on the wrist. But then maybe if the jail term could be put over that, maybe that would be enough de deterrent. What do you think? Well, I think first I would like us to start uh, extraying even the political party systems we have, the political party structures we have in the country. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes you see immediately after the election, I never could go by the registering parties that didn't, uh, didn't perform well in an election. We saw a case, for instance, the 2019 election, where well over 60 parties were deregistered at the end of the election. 
And so for a few that are also remaining, sometimes reorganizing or restructuring these parties also take a little time. For instance, most of these parties are just concluding their either congresses or even election of their officials. I mean, those, that, that happened uh, just in recent time. And even on the part of INE, sometimes I feel like there is complacency, especially from the uh, from the department in INE that is supposed to be responsible for tracking uh, the expenses of the political parties and even the activities of the political parties. I mean, the the uh, the uh, election. Uh, Election and party monitoring department in INEC. So mm. I, I I feel those are the places to to start uh, to start the, the conversation from first to look at the political party structure and also even on the part of INEC. Mm. There have been a lot of contravention of this of this law. This does not even start now. I like the fact that you are going back as far as even 2014-2015 to see. And then like uh, the other uh, my my co-panelists had also mentioned. The challenge also of sanction is also is, is still there, but mm -hmm. then the biggest thing is also about the the inability of the agencies of government of the structures in place to even track political party spending. If this is a country where we have seen individuals donating as much as hundred million to political parties, where the law is clear about what an individual can spend, what parties can spend, it is difficult to track some of this sort of. Uh, uh, this sort of donations that come to political party. Now we will have a bigger challenge ahead of us for, uh, for the coming election. The new electoral act is saying the parties can spend up to about five million naira, or five billion naira for the presidential mm -hmm. contest. These expenses have started already with the purchase of funds. These expenses are started with the administrative fees that people are paying. These mm. expenses have started with even money that people are paying to the state secretariat. We are striking them. At what point will I never begin the striking? Even if mm. political parties are failing, for the few that I never have tracked, I never can even come public to begin to tell that the public what the parties are doing. Maybe that will spur the parties to do the needful. That will spur the parties to do what is expected of them. Huh. Um, Balaho, I want to take, take it up from where Paul has stopped. Let me paint a picture. For example, the monies that politicians spend under the table, I mean, they run into billions. And we, just as he said, some part parties, you have to pay one, 100 million to pick a ticket, a nomination form in the first instance. And this is not the monies that you're going to spend campaigning. That's just as an aside. And, and the Electoral Act you know, actually is against all of this, like he has also said. But then you spoke about the deterrence, and my mind, I'm, st I'm still tinkering on it. The fact that INEC has not really necessarily made moves to start striking, like Paul has said, and the fact that this might continue to happen because it's a vicious cycle, does that not boil down to the lawlessness that we have in the country in general? I'm talking about the fact that Nigeria has so many laws that addresses almost everything but we never really get to see the enforcement of these laws. So why are we even having this conversation in the first place? Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to also speak from the perspective of an auditor. Uh, well, the earliest job I did in my life was as an auditor. I'm a chartered accountant. Mm -hmm. um, most of the money that moves around in, in, within the political circles happens in, the, the, it happens in cash. The problem with cash is traceability. Where is the track of money that is being spent in cash? So I need to pay for a service and I pay in cash. Somebody is donating to me and instead of transferring money or issuing a check, decide to give me some cash in dollars. How do you account for that? How do you track that? What will an auditor see that will help him to unravel that situation. Huh. So part of the problem we have is how the spending have been, uh, how do I put it now, substantially in cash. Go ask anybody who has been to all those uh, delegate uh, uh, spending areas. All those things are in cash. They, they, they come with Naira in cash, they come with dollars. But, but uh, do you think that, do you think that this is actually deliberate? This is something, this is a strategy that is being employed by these politicians and the parties to evade some of these, prop, you know, I mean, the, the policies that are within um, the Electoral Acts, the, the fact that it might, you know, one way or the other catch up with them. And so this is, this might be a way of, you know, evading all of that. 
definitely um, it's, it's part of the game. You leave all those money that will make you break the rule. You keep them totally off the books. They won't be by transfer. They will be by, by, by currency, cash. So it, 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 it is left for you to know how you want to capture that. Or you capture it totally off the books of the organization. Now, INEC and the Electoral Act is aware of this possibility. So there is also a part where it mentioned an accountant who helps political parties to cook books. Hmm. And he has a sanction for that accountant. Having said that, the way we use cash in our electoral process makes it easy for political parties to beat the rules. They will declare what they want to declare. They will pass through the system what they want to pass through the system. And they will leave the rest completely out of the books. Hmm. Let's talk about the, um, the campaign finance law. I'm bringing back, bringing back to you, Paul. Um, do we think that the political parties understand the campaign finance law for them to be totally in adherence? Again, if we have had issues like this dating back to 2014, and it's left, I mean, kudos to people like Sarah. Sarah has continuously put government on their toes in terms of accountability. Whether they've made a leeway or not is another conversation, uh, you know, for another day. But has it not come to um, a point where maybe these acts or these parts of the electoral or finance law needs to be, you know, amended so much so that there will be stiffer sanctions? Because, I mean, if we keep complaining about these issues year in, year out, and then we still have the same conversations and we say, well, uh, we know this and that, uh, but they're not doing this, we're waiting on... How much longer can we get... Um, go around in these circles. Again, we're looking at trust here. We're looking at people who we want to bring into power to lead us, people who we can trust with our monies, with the future of our, our country. If we cannot trust them at the point where they're trying to pick who runs on the platform of these parties, and we cannot trust them in terms of running their own finances, how can we trust them with the offices that we're giving to them? I like the point you're making about trust here, and especially because it has become a very uh, expensive commodity in our electoral democracy. If it is not for the question of trust, politicians will have devised another means of engaging with uh, the voters, of buying off the voters. Because of the lack of trust, that is where you are seeing the exchange of cash as a transaction, I mean, in the, in the whole transaction chain. But then again, the laws are there, like we know, but um, it is because, of course, uh, people have find other means of breaking the laws. For instance, uh, cash for vote. i give you an instance. You go back to the election in 2018. It's as simple as one party is giving them 4,000, another party is giving uh, voters 5,000. And you can trace these uh, funds, sometimes even back to the government, sometimes to some individuals that are connected to the government. It's not like we don't know this thing. It's the political will, the determination to do that that is lacking. But then what is the point going forward? I think for me is to begin to talk about um, a whole uh, reform a complete structural reform, especially finance reforms in our own elections, we should begin to see how we will de-emphasize uh, the, the impact of money in our election and encourage uh, other means of bringing up legitimate candidates in our own election. I think that is, for me, where to start from. For instance, if the issue of 100 million become, an import, uh, become a permanent feature in our democracy, I bet you by the time you come to the next cycle of election, these resources would be doubled. And then if you look at the ripple effect on other aspects of the economy, mm. and then also the gap that will continue to exist between the half and the half nots, it becomes it brings up also challenge, especially in the leadership recruitment process. So this is a whole chain that needs to be addressed. But I, I feel the first to do is to begin to talk about what sort of financial, what sort of reform do we want to see in our own in our own finance. I agree, for instance, like a million naira for violating this law, I think is, for me, uh, ridiculous. Uh, we need to see a review uh, 
done to this to see how we can increase this, perhaps that could help to sanitize the process. It is one way to go. But most importantly, also a mindset reorientation in all of these things. But just not need to be told, for instance, to, to I mean, anybody that will want to work with a party or vote for a party, we want to do that based on the part that they can trust the party, like you said, mm. that the party is opening its books, that the party is open to being probed even by the public. Mm. So, I mean, let us start from there. We don't even need INF to shout on the party or the public to shout on the party. A party that is really open, that is really uh, uh, that that is futuristic and also is people oriented, should begin to even open it for even be, before even without INF or even the public access. I think for me, okay. those are the kind of reorientation or mindset reorientation we want to start seeing in our own elections. Okay, and finally, Bola as as a money man. Um, we're pushing for all kinds of electoral reforms, as Paul has said, but then we forget the, the very the most important, which is the money. And he's also talked about the rippling effect of these increase in monies for nomination forms and you know campaign monies. So there's a mopping up of cash, which affects the average person out there. And we d maybe we don't really realize you know the effect it's having on us. Um, so. What do we do, aside from, you know, just calling for these reforms? How does the common person get involved? Again, I want to go through the political party membership aspect. The average person who holds, whether it's PDP, APT, SDP, APGA, um, um, what do they call it, ID, you know, membership card, um, does that person count? Does that person's voice count, apart from the money bags within the party? Maybe if that is also included in the reforms, maybe the opening of books would be easier, easily done. I'm, I'm just wondering. Okay, um, that, that, that's a whole lot. Um, the, the journey to where you foresee is going to take us a while. That is because um, the, the attitude of the politicians, uh, and don't forget that the politicians are not outside of the decision makers themselves. So at the state level, when we're speaking of the, of the, of the politician, we're talking about the governor who is the, the, the boss at the state level. At the federal level, you're talking about the president. Mm. So these same people are decision makers at the same time they are politicians. The same with the lawmakers. The lawmakers are politicians and they're also the ones that are making the laws. Mm. So for us as uh, as um, uh, citizens and for civil liberty organizations and other stakeholders, we need to get more involved. See, okay. in reality, the kind of a, of a democracy that we have adopted, uh, which is more or less like the American bicameral uh, 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 model, mm -hmm. is an expensive model, very expensive. Um, in, in, in America, for example, I remember Obama raised an equivalent of over 400 billion naira to prosecute the, the election in, in, in the, his, his first uh, election in America mm -hmm. as president. Mm -hmm. So well, here is the difference. The difference is that America follows the money. Yeah. We know exactly who are the people that donated this money. And the base of donation is wider. In Nigeria, only very few people make that money available. Mm. And that affects the independence the, of, 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 of those parties. Those money bags can actually have exercise very strong influence on what happens within the party. It's slightly different from where the money source is wider. Okay. Well, I want to say thank you. Unfortunately, our time is fast spent. Bolahon Olojade is uh, an economist. And of course, Paul James is of Yaga, Africa. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being part of the conversation. We hope to have more of these in the future. Thanks for having us. All right. Well, we've come to the end of the show tonight. I want to thank you all for staying with us. And uh, Plus Politics returns tomorrow, same time, 7 p.m. on your number one. Uh, station. I'm Mary Anakon. I'll see you tomorrow as we continuously talk for development. Have a good evening.